Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we leverage science and technology to protect endangered species and ecosystems around the world. Welcome to this month's Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe and your host today. I'm here today with Dave Goulson, who is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex, who specializes in bee ecology. Uh, Dave has published more than 300 scientific articles on ecology and conservation of bumblebees and other insects, and is the author of five books about bumblebees and other buzzing insects. His most recent book, Silent Earth, was published in the United States in September of this year. Uh, Dave founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in 2006 and is the winner of far too many awards in science and science communications to list here. But all of us should be incredibly grateful for both his scientific work and his efforts to spread the word about the importance of insects to our collective future. So, Dave, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Sean. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Great. Well, we're going to just jump right in because uh, people who listen to the podcast regularly know that um, I'm really interested in uh, insects in the sort of insect apocalypse that people have been talking about recently and something I know you're very familiar with. Um, but before we jump into that, I just wanted to ask, like, what was your inspiration for getting involved in this field? Like, why do you study insects? I, I've always loved insects. It's one of those things I, I can't actually really explain why or where it came from. But when I was really young, um, I, at primary schools, about five or six years old, I, I got into the habit of searching for caterpillars at lunchtime and putting them in my lunchbox and taking them home and trying to work out what leaves to feed them. And some of them, the ones I didn't kill, turned into you know moths and butterflies. And I thought that was just amazing. And I, you know, it's been a real privilege to somehow manage to make a, a career out of chasing around after insects. That is a wonderful thing. Um, and the, the transformation from caterpillar to moth or butterfly is one of the more miraculous things that happens that we can witness in nature. Um, so one of the things that's so great about your enthusiasm for insects and the uh, excerpt from your book that was in The uh, Guardian recently was the way that it is changing people's opinions. Um, I was joking earlier with Sam, my director of uh, communications about her uh, general dislike for insects. And she was saying that uh, your enthusiasm is changing her mind. And I think that's probably something that you're looking for broadly. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's always, so it was nice to hear that you're converting someone to the cause. Um, it's a long way to go. You know, the, the reality is that most people you know, don't much like insects. They think they're going to bite them or sting them or or something, and their reaction is one of sort of fear. Um, and I was really spending my life trying to persuade people to love insects, or if that's going a bit far, to to respect insects because they're they're really important. And actually, I mean, amazing, beautiful, fascinating things if you take the time to look at them. You're absolutely right. So that that brings me actually to the topic of your your new book, Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypse. Um, and in the book, of course, you're going to get into this in more detail, but tell us a little bit about what the, the sort of the thesis, what the what your goal is with that book and talk, you know, besides insects being incredibly beautiful. And of course, we are broadly aware of some of the things that insects do for us, but give us some specific examples about, you know, why we need to worry about the, not just um, each species of insect, but the overall number of insects, which is really what we're talking about with the apocalypse, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, insects, um, people don't really appreciate how important they are. They, they make up the bulk of life on Earth in terms of numbers of species. Uh, we've named about 1.5 million species of animal and plants, and 1.1 million of those are insects, you know, so they are biodiversity. Um, and and they, they're, so they're food for a whole raft of birds, bats, and all sorts of other creatures. They... Um, but then they perform all sorts of other kind of really vital ecosystem roles, ecosystem services, they're often called. Uh, so the, the most famous of which is they pollinate um, uh, both wildflowers and 75% of the crops we grow in the world. But they do a whole bunch of other stuff too. Um, 
you know, they're recyclers, so dead bodies, dead trees, cow pats, leaves, they all get tidied away and broken down with the help of insects. And they help to keep the soil healthy and they distribute seeds and they control crop pests. And basically, you name it, they're busy doing it. And much of this is, you know, people are just oblivious. They, they you know, maybe we, we, we're, I think most people are aware that pollination is important, but that's about the only one of the, the things insects do that people really appreciate. When we were talking before, you mentioned some other th- roles that insects play in the ecosystem. So, you know, pollination, obviously the most famous one. Um, a lot of people have, of course, heard of dung beetles and have experienced other things that some insects do. But, you know, thinking about not just their role as food for birds and bats, as you suggested, and other insects that then move up the food chain, uh, there's some other key things that insects do for us that if we lost that, would be a pretty pretty big problem for us. I, yeah, I mean, honestly, that because it's hard to think of actually anything that happens on 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 land or in fresh water. It's it's an interesting side issue that there aren't really any insects in the sea. Their roles there are all played by crustaceans, but that's a, for another day, I think. <laughs> but on land, they're 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 everywhere. So there's you know there's no food web or food chain that doesn't have lots of insects in it. Um, and this role as recyclers is, is you know, uh, it's very unglamorous, isn't it? But, you know, the second an animal dies or, or within a few seconds, a fly will arrive. And not long after that, maybe a burying beetle and a whole bunch of other creatures. And in fact, it's so reliable that, that you know, forensic entomologists can use this to tell when someone died from the, the composition of the, and age of the insects that are feeding on the corpse. Pretty gruesome stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it might not be glamorous, but it's really important. Otherwise, there'd be stinking corpses lying around the, 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 the place apart from many other things. It, it is amazing. I was recently um, in, a, in, a, in a tropical forest and saw a, uh, I think it was actually a chimpanzee. Um, it went to the bathroom right in front of us. There was no bathroom nearby, so it just pooped right there. And um, it then went away and I went over to, to check out what he left behind. And it had not been more than 10 or 15 seconds and there was already a dozen flies on the feces. It was amazing to see how quickly they had gotten there. And we didn't, I didn't see them come in. They just suddenly appeared. It's, it's remarkable that yeah. they must be flying around the forest at all times waiting for that smell. I, I, I could, it's a slightly disgusting anecdote, but I had a similar experience. I, years and years ago, I cycled across the Sahara and uh, it's a pretty bleak place, as you might guess. You know, you just, just miles and miles of nothing. Uh, but anyway, you know, obviously no toilets. So you, you do what you have to do. And even there, you know, within seconds, a fly will appear or half a dozen flies will appear as if, as, you know, they're just materializing out of thin air. Yeah. And then, what do they do? You know, I, I might've been the first human along there for weeks, but somehow there's been, there's flies waiting, you know? Uh, yeah. They're extraordinarily resilient little creatures in many ways, at least some of them are. Yeah. That's amazing. So you're specifically um, do a lot of work with bumblebees and some of what we might call the, the charismatic uh, insects. Uh, but of course, those aren't the only important ones, as we've just been talking about with with flies, which are most people's not favorite example of an insect. Um, but I'm I'm interested in sort of using them as a tool to promote conservation in general. And is that is that sort of one of the things that you're thinking about with the Bumblebee Trust? Yeah, I mean, this you know, it's it's much easier to get people engaged with caring for bumblebees or butterflies. Uh, after that, you start to struggle, maybe dragonflies and to one or two other of the more charismatic groups. But the, the vast majority of insects, you know, are, are, are a harder sell. Um, and uh, so bees are a really good way. And they kind of, I use them in two ways. One is a kind of a foot in the door to the conversation about how insects are important. You know, you can, people are aware of pollination, but then you can say, well, hang on, it isn't just pollination and it's not just bees. You know, there are lots of other insects doing important stuff. Um, Of course, as well, in a practical sense, if you're conserving bees and butterflies, you're 
looking after the habitats that they live in, then you'll probably conserve most of the other creatures as well. So you, you in there, you're, you're kind of using them like an umbrella species eye. Um, but it is a, a source of constant frustration to me that, that you know, these other insects people don't care about them they hate them i think it's well perhaps that's a bit much but they you know earwigs nobody loves earwigs i i don't know why um actually they're really important they're they're fascinating little creatures they're by bio, biocontrol agents their favorite food are aphids nobody seems to know that um they, they have this really interesting life cycle where they show parental care the mum makes a little nest and she lays her eggs and she she looks after her offspring she she guards them she feeds them until they're about half grown and then she shoes them out of the nest at which point if they don't leave she eats she eats them so she's not the perfect mother but you know uh, but they have this whole life cycle it's going on and all around us in our backyards uh really fascinating little creatures and you know the only emotion they elicit from most people is disgust if they pop out of a salad or something you know right and of course they have they have nothing to do with our ears or wanting to go into our ears no no i i i don't think anyone really knows where the name came from but as far as i'm aware um it's 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 not a habit of theirs going into ears <laughs> which is a good thing um <laughs> so, uh, one of the things, so there's two different aspects of this. There's the loss of species, and then there's the loss of the number of insects. And there's been a couple of stories that have come out recently about the decline in absolute numbers or the biomass of insects. And of course, the way that a lot of us experience that is driving at dusk and the number of insects that hit our windshield compared to what uh, some of us remember what it was like when we were younger, which is, of course, completely anecdotal. But then people have actually documented that. Can you talk a little bit about like, what that means and what the implications are of that decline? Yeah, and it's it's really interesting, isn't it, that, that you know, because most people don't care about insects, they haven't noticed them quietly disappearing or becoming much less common. But almost everybody of a certain age has noticed this 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 windshield phenomenon, uh, and it's it's created a lot of debate. There was a, there was quite a sensible uh, explanation someone put forward was that it may just be that cars have become more aerodynamic over time, and that's why there's there's no splats on the windows. Um, but actually, to try and see if that was the case, there was a, a, a an experiment recently done in Kent in the UK where they recruited people with old-fashioned vintage cars to take part. <laughs> <laughs> and no, no matter how aerodynamic the car, there's still no insect splats. So, um, uh, so it does seem to be there really are a lot fewer insects. Um, and obviously, you know that that is is should be a major cause for for concern. And we we also have, we do have much better data as well. It's very patchy. Um, and one of the problems if you're a, you know an insect scientist is there are so many of them and so few people counting them. We only really have long-term data for a, a tiny, tiny proportion of of the world's insects. Um, again, it's, it tends to be the charismatic species. So, you know, butterflies are relatively well monitored and we have really good data in Europe showing that they're in decline and have been for decades. Uh, in fact, possibly even even hundreds of years, um, and m of course, monarch butterflies in in North America are, are you know come up in the news quite regularly. I'd imagine they they we get it over here because they're uh, they seem to be in pretty rapid decline. They are. Um, and anecdotally, we all remember seeing them and sort of getting excited when the you could see them coming through migrating, and uh, you know I feel lucky if I see one or two a year now, and uh, that's you know way fewer than I remember as a child. So it is, it is, that one is one that people do notice because again, a beautiful creature that seems relatively benign. And so people, people like it, um, not unlike a lot of bumblebees. Um, it also seems, you know, we've heard recently about the number of birds that we've lost, not just bird species, but absolute numbers of birds. And as it turns out, a lot of those birds are insectivorous. And so, you know, Birds is something that a lot of people care about. Or birds are something, uh, and so we, um, you know, we have to think about when we lose these insects. And 
I have to imagine that some of this is due to um, climate change and some of it is due to habitat loss and fragmentation. And some of it may be to you to uh, due to the use of insecticides and things like that. Um, and is anybody looking into like, what are the relative causes of the decline? And then there's this sex question about, you know, can we actually say that the decline of insectivorous bird numbers is related to the decline in insects or is that an inference that is hard to test all of these things are pretty hard to test actually because it's so complicated um uh, you know there are there are no doubt multiple drivers of bird declines and insect declines and probably the drivers differ from place to place and depending on which species you're focused on um but it's it's hard to believe that the the the, the the huge drop in insect abundance we've seen hasn't contributed to the decline of insectivorous birds. And certainly proportionally, insect-eating birds seem to have declined on average more than other kinds of birds. Um, and, you know, I know the figures for the UK are much better than elsewhere, but uh, for example, there's there's a little bird with the called the spotted flycatcher, um, which, you know, you can tell from the name what it does, um, what it eats. <laughs> And uh, they they were un unlike the earwig, yeah. Um, and they were really common. And I remember them. This this has happened in my lifetime. And actually, that's what's scary about much of this stuff is it's it's happened on our watch. You know, this is this is since I was a kid, we've seen you know a halving of the number of UK butterflies, for example. And and the, the spotted flycatcher is population has fallen by ninety three percent since 1966 when i was one year old um cuckoos which are you know we have one species of cuckoo in uh, uh in britain and it's this very kind of iconic bird because of the the, the song is so distinctive in the spring um and that they're down i think 77 percent in the same period so we've seen some you know really staggering drops in abundance the the so to come back to what's causing it i mean it, it's it's on there are people trying to to unravel it, but it's pretty difficult to, you know, assign a proportion of blame to different things. It's undoubtedly a lot of it is habitat loss, and particularly in the tropics, that must be contributing enormously. Um, uh, it, the intensification of farming, the associated chemical use, not just pesticides, but fertilizers seem to be having quite big effects. Um, climate change is is clearly starting to kick in. We've seen that with bumblebees, which are basically cold climate insects. They, they're big and furry to keep warm, and they really don't like hot weather. Uh, so they're retreating northwards in the northern hemisphere. And light pollution seems to be playing a role with moths, and uh, there's a whole bunch of other probably smaller factors as well. Um, so it, it's complicated and messy, but at the end of the day, it's all down to us. Yeah. So listening to you talk it's easy to imagine why you've made a bit of a transition from strict academic work into a slightly advocacy sort of a role and uh, i just wanted to hear a little bit about that journey and what that has meant for you um sort of on a professional level but also on a personal level to to make that transition and the the opportunity that other scientists may have to make that transition yeah, uh, it, it's been an interesting journey, really, and not one I ever planned. Or you know, uh, I, when I was when I started as an academic, I was I was really more interested in insect behaviour. I was just fascinated by insects, and I spent years studying how bumblebees choose which flowers they're going to visit. And and uh, uh, yeah, it's, I could talk about that for hours, but this is a bit off topic today. Um, but I, I eventually kind of it dawned on me that these creatures I was studying, that there was a lot of evidence that th there used to be many more species um, in the area where I was working in the southern uh, south of the UK than I was seeing. You know, there were there's a whole, I, if I opened, a, there was a book written in 1975, uh, which talked about things like the shrill carder and the short-haired bumblebee and the moss carder, species you don't have in North America, but uh, but I couldn't find them anywhere. And I thought, well, so hang on a minute, you know, I can still find some bumblebees, but the, the species richness seems to have halved since this book was written. So I started 
I kind of became in, intrigued as to why some species were declining more than others and trying to understand what was causing that. Um, and so that my research kind of shifted focus and became more applied, trying to understand the declines and, and also experimenting with, you know, what could we do? What kinds of flowers should we be encouraging if we wanted these bees to come back and this kind of thing? Um, but it, I, I mean, we published dozens and dozens of papers on, on this. And eventually I started to get a bit frustrated because nobody was reading those papers. There was no, you know, apart from perhaps a few other academics interested in the same subject, um, nobody was doing anything with it. You know, I, you can publish as many papers as you like. There won't be one more bumblebee as a result of it. Um, uh, so, I, it, and there doesn't seem to be, there's a bit of a disconnect, you know, governments fund research, but then they don't, they don't bother to, to see what it found, you know, there's no clear mechanism mm -hmm. for take, mm -hmm. taking academic research and 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 conveying it in a simple sort of form to politicians or or nature reserve wardens or anyone else, farmers, gardeners, the people that could actually do something. So I basically I sort of slowly mutated into into a kind of I suppose an activist, if you like. Um, I started this charity, the, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, um, 15 years ago now, which which has gone really well and is creating habitat and campaigning and uh, doing lots of great things. And yeah, there, there are undoubtedly more bumblebees in the UK because we started that than if we hadn't bothered, which is That's great. Fantastic. Um, but even then, I, I you know it felt a bit like it was a very small kind of. Um, group of people that you know joined the trust and and were doing something for bumblebees and i kind of thought well you know we somehow need to get to to everybody else we're in this trapped in a kind of bubble of like-minded environmentalists who really care about insect declines and the state of the planet but most people don't seem to care and i guess that's why i sort of also then moved on to trying to communicate with a bigger audience, writing books and popular articles, magazine, giving public talks and all these kind of things to try to kind of break out of that bubble. But I often feel I haven't actually succeeded, you know, that still most of the people that, that buy the books are probably ones who already cared, you know, it's the ones that mm -hmm. don't that I somehow need, need to, to get to. And that's tricky. It, it is tricky. Um, so I had two other things that I wanted to ask you about. One was about the use of technology in insect conservation and in your work, whether it's through community or citizen science or remote sensing or modeling. Are there things that you're able to do now with technology that you could only have dreamed about 10 or 15 years ago or that you just never even conceived of and now you're able to do? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, obviously, um, technology is advancing at a prodigious rate, and that has all sorts of spin-off benefits for researchers like me. Um, so within my kind of research career, people have developed uh, a, a kind of radar system for tracking bee movements, uh, which has revealed all sorts of really cool stuff about how far they go from their nests and this kind of thing. Um, you can fit little little. RFID tags onto bees and have a sensor on their nest so you know how often they go foraging and how long they stay out for and how much they food they bring back and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Amazing. Um, so it's definitely helped us study these insects. This, I think in the near future, there'll be some really cool developments. So for example, um, uh, the, the, there's, there's a lot of people trying to develop automated identification so that you could in theory, point a camera at a, a, a patch of flowers, say, and and it would automatically identify and count every insect visitor. And if you did that, and if if it were possible, um, you know that would that would mean we could we could gather much more data on on population trends of insects on a scale that you know at the moment we just can't imagine because there's just not that many people right. able to do the counting. Um, so this, you know, it, it will no doubt advance, um, and new things uh, will will come along that will will help us. I'm sure. Yeah, it's really exciting. And of course, uh, all of these things, whether it's uh, different ways to find and identify and count the insects, um, and just sort of tracking them and knowing what the threats are to them, is a big part of what NatureServe and the NatureServe network is all about. Because we're paying attention not just to mammals or birds, but to insects and freshwater mussels and to other uh, taxa that aren't always the ones that 
get the news. And so we're really excited that you're working um, in this field as well. Um, and thinking about that in terms of you know what you've done so far, you've got a lot of career in front of you. And I'm just curious, you know, we talked a little bit about your just sort of how you always were interested in insects and were collecting them from a young age. And at some point in the future, many years in the future, when you're looking back, what do you what would you like to be able to say was your your legacy of the thing that you've achieved through your career? Ah, uh, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I know one of your previous guests said that if they could save one species, then uh, that they would think their job was done. And I mean, that would wouldn't that be a thing to be able to say? Um, but I, I mean, this sounds absolutely absurd. But basically, probably like you and many other people who work in this area, I'm trying to save the planet. And you know, that I, obviously that's ridiculously grandiose and and i can't on my own um mm -hmm. but you know that's what we need to do that's 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 why i'm i do what i do we we are i and it really can't be overemphasized we are in this massive environmental crisis you know climate change is getting a lot of attention uh, i think many of us would argue that biodiversity loss is is at least as important and the two are interwoven along with a whole bunch of other yeah. environmental issues like soil erosion and um deforestation and and so on and so on and you know it's 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 all it's like a battle um it, you know time is running out and, and so i mean i guess saving the planet might be a ridiculous ambition doing it making it less bad than it will otherwise be if i could honestly say at the end of my career i've i've made it a little less bad then i'd be pretty happy and if you're doing that and I'm doing that and everybody at NatureServe and in the network and many other conservation organizations are doing it incrementally, we can actually make that difference, which reminds me of uh, the rivets on the plane analogy that Paul Ehrlich came up with where, you know, there's thousands of rivets on a plane and you can take a bunch of them out. But at some point you take out a critical one or a critical couple and everything falls apart. And in some ways, it feels like that's where we are with the planet, whether it's insects or other species, uh, climate change, and there's all these little things happening all over. And at what point do we cross a line um, where climate chaos and the insect apocalypse and the decline of birds and all these things get us to the point where you're, where you're trying to keep us from getting to? Yeah, I mean, it is potentially terrifying isn't it and it is easy to get depressed about all of this stuff um but actually you know that there to be positive i mean the, the the final quarter of silent earth is basically what can we do and the good news is that you know you people can get involved you know a, a lot of environmental issues like tropical deforestation or climate change or whatever people do feel quite helpless because your individual actions seem kind of you know um inconsequential but with insects because they live all around us um and they can recover really you know most haven't gone extinct yet and given the right given some habitat they can their numbers can increase really quickly unlike tigers or orangutans or whatever um and and people can do things in their own backyard and see a difference you know within within weeks uh, even days, um, plant the right flowers, plant some native wildflowers, some bee-friendly flowers, and and the insects will come. You know, build it and they will come, as Kevin Costner once said in a terrible movie. <laughs> but uh, um, it's true. And so, you know, if enough people did that and got involved, then it, it really would make a difference. And that is actually a really great positive note to end on. Um, and you're right. Little different, little changes, little behavior modifications, a little bit of work that we all do in our own backyards can make a positive difference. And uh, that's an important message to remember. And um, everyone should read Silent Earth so that they can learn a little bit more about that and um, support the uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, of course, and uh, work on conserving bumblebees and other insects um, in other places besides the UK, of course. So, uh, Dave, thanks for thanks for joining us today, and thanks for uh, all the work that you're doing to um, help prevent uh, the collapse that we were just talking about, and also giving us really positive, um, optimistic way to think about uh, everything that individuals can do. So, thanks again. No, it's, it's been a pleasure, and, and you, the work you guys do is absolutely vital. So, you know, keep going. Awesome. Thanks very much.
This has been Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, your host, the president and CEO of NatureServe. And we look forward to talking with you again next month.